What's up? Now, you are so lucky because today I have Chase Hughes here. He's the coolest person I've ever met. I am a world-class hypnotist. I'm amazing at changing people's lives. And what I know about psychology is so small compared to what he knows. Literally, you can look at someone and tell you everything about them just by looking at specific behaviors, mannerisms. So we're going to dive deeper into that today. He spent tens of millions of dollars in research to literally learn everything there is to know about human beings. And I promise you, this is something you cannot find anywhere else. So if you're interested in psychology, if you're interested in persuasion, if you're interested in having the only real life superpower that actually exists on planet Earth, then continue watching this video. This is going to be a conversation, I'm not really going to be talking to you guys. I'm going to be asking him questions I want to know the answers to. And you guys are welcome to view it as the audience. So welcome. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming. So there's a few things I have a question for you on. Um, First of all, when you're profiling someone, right? Like when you're looking at someone and, and you immediately determine what, what you think they can do or, you know, their background, their behavior, their tendencies, yeah. what are the first couple things you look at? Because I usually look at their eyes. I don't really look at anything else. Yeah, well, we spend most of our time in conversation looking at a person's eyes. So one thing that is great and extremely reliable in the human eye is something called blink rate. Mm -hmm. And this just means how often a person is blinking. So we'll tend to blink less often the more focused and interested we are. So mm -hmm. low stress means we're a lot really focused. Mm -hmm. Like when the last really badass movie I watched was called Interstellar. My favorite film. Yeah. I cried, but when I wasn't crying during that movie, my blink rate was probably around a four. Four times per minute. So that's not very often. Mm -hmm. It's like once every uh, 15 seconds. Yeah. And like during the math part of my SATs or if I'm going through something stressful, the blink rate will go up and up to like 80. So if you just imagine like if you're sitting at an airport, for instance, and there's somebody 20 feet away from you, you can get an instantaneous judge. Could, would you be able to tell the difference right away between 4 and 80? 100%. Yeah. Anybody can. Yeah, of course. So instantaneously, even someone you're not even speaking to, you know how interested somebody is across the room and how stressed out a person is. So what we're looking for is not that person's blink rate is fast or slow, we're watching for changes. Mm -hmm. So we start a conversation, we don't need to count how often a person's blinking. Mm -hmm. what, what you wanna do is look at the, we start a conversation, is it, does it look kinda normal? Is it slow or is it fast? And when does it change? So if I'm a sales guy and I, right as I start talking to you about the terms or the percentage rate of a loan, your blink rate starts skyrocketing, I know I have an issue to deal with. Mm -hmm. I know right away, instead of waiting until the end and the guy says, no, I'm not interested, I know immediately what the problem is or where the problem so as lies. Soon as, as soon as you say it, it's, it's not slow. There's no lag here. There's an instantaneous increase in blink rate. Let's say I'm objecting to something you just said, like the price, the interest rate, whatever. Yeah. Immediately, it, there's, there's no lag there. Right after. Right, right after. after. Okay. So if I saw your blink rate start going up, I would say, what, what did I, what were we just talking about? What was the topic? And if it was something weird, like uh, riding on a roller coaster for you, you might, your blink rate might start going up right after we talk about that. So I know as a sales guy, as a person who's influencing anyone, even if it's kids, if I'm a school teacher, that that's an important data point. But it shows me, depending on the context, I shouldn't ever talk about that again. I need to ask more questions or I need to figure out what's going on. Instead of, I'm going to wait till the end of an interaction and randomly figure out whether or not I was successful. So when you're seeing a baseline, right? You're looking at someone and you're trying to get a baseline. You're looking immediately at to what, at, like, okay, is their blink rate slow or fast? Immediately. It's the first thing you notice yeah. when you're talking to them. So if I'm new to this, right? Like, I've never studied body language, know nothing about, you know, I have no sensory acuity whatsoever. Right. Uh, and I look at someone that's obviously something that's pretty easy to tell. Now, let's say I forget about it because the average person will look and then not really pay attention and then say something, you know, what, what can I do to practice getting better at just observing that? The cool thing about blink rate is a, we're making most of our eye contact mm -hmm. uh, with a person's eyes and conversation most of the time. So yeah. it's already there. It's right in front of you. And B, if you think about you, when your blink rate went from 30 to 80 or mm -hmm. 20 to 80, you didn't notice that it happened. Mm -hmm. It's an unconscious thing. And that's what makes it extremely reliable. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is we're all on Zoom all the time now on these video calls. 
We can watch it on YouTube. You can watch a TV interview. You can watch a presidential debate. And we can do this 24 hours a day. You can train your brain to understand these concepts. And that's one of those simple things that's easy to do. Got it. Now, you know, I brought this example up in another video we shot together where, you know, we're turning right uh, on the street and you immediately noticed that someone was bulimic because you noticed that there were teeth marks in between their knuckles and that their nail was eroding from stomach acid. But you noticed that in a fraction of a second, maybe, I don't know, she went like this and you had maybe two seconds to observe everything about her and you just instantaneously got it. Or there's, there's a lot of things I'll notice, for example, our camera guy, Jack, he's deaf in one ear and you immediately could tell which year it was, you know, yeah. uh, and you said because someone who has a hard time hearing they might tilt the ear that they need or they'll, what'd you say, they'll look, they'll look away or they'll look at your well, mouth? Anybody that has hearing problems tends to watch a person's mouth instead of their eyes during the conversation. Got it. Yeah, so you're able to observe these things in a matter of, I would say, the same way if I say, hi, how are you? You go, good. You see it the same way, right? It's like almost like you're, you're seeing another layer to, to language that most people aren't aware of. Yeah. You know, obviously that's two decades worth of practice and experience, but how can we get you know, average guy, right? Average person, female, doesn't matter. How can we become more perceptual? And you said also women probably have an advantage here, right? And women do have an advantage over men, hands down. Yeah. Uh, women are born with, uh, the, you know, we call our brain gray matter, yeah. but the white matter in your brain is what's important. And this is called myelinated neurons. It's a connectivity network. Mm -hmm. But between our two hemispheres, there's some connective tissue called the corpus callosum. Women, uh, by and large, are born with a lot more of that connective tissue between the two hemispheres than men. This allows them to interpret meaning and concepts a lot faster than, faster than men. Now, just from vague memory here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, just so the average person can realize, the corpus callosum is the part of the brain that helps communicate from the right hemisphere to the left, right, and separates yeah. that? Yeah. So when you're having a seizure, there's obviously something wrong with that part of the brain, or it's bouncing signals back and forth? It could be. A seizure yeah. can happen almost anywhere in the brain. Got it. If it happen, unless it happens in your spinal cord and then you're dead. Got it. Okay. So now I'm observing someone. Now, oftentimes there's a lot of time, you know, I'll, I'll be in a, a business meeting and I'm potentially wanting to work with someone or partner up with someone or I would date a girl and, you know, I suspect that they might uh, have done something that's not okay, like some kind of affair. Right. You know, what is the first sign of deception, right? Like, I'll, tell, I'll give you a quick story. Uh, this happened to me three different times where I suspected that because they, they weren't answering me completely. Their baseline was very off, right? So usually a girl will respond to me within five, 10 minutes. Now it's been maybe 30, 40 minutes. Uh, they're late. They're not communicating. They come. They're dressed up extra nice, have a lot more perfume on than normal. Uh, and when they come and I'm suspicious and I'm, you know, I'm pretty frustrated and I'm irritated because I don't like that kind of behavior and I'm automatically assuming right. that potentially they might have done something their immediate reaction is to be extra, you know, like, like happy. They're, they're like, you know, they're laughing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's a deterrent from being guilty, right? Like, what, if, let's say I'm guilty, I had an affair with someone, and I'm female, because I'm assuming men and women might be different. Uh, what, would, what are some deceptive behaviors? Uh, in general, I would say what you brought up there was a deviation from baseline. Yeah. That should be a data point no matter what. It doesn't mean deception. It doesn't mean that there's bad stuff going on. It means but that a, a big change took place. Mm -hmm. So something's different. Yeah. So especially with people that we know, our family members, our kids, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, we know their baseline. We know how stuff usually happens. And yeah. when something starts deviating... That should be a, a data point, not necessarily a red flag. It just means a it's a variable. Point. There's something different. That's yeah. what it means. Okay. So when I teach deception detection, I train intelligence agencies, I train police and interrogation and yeah. stuff. And, and stuff, like it's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So one thing that we teach them is that that baseline is important. How does the person behave under normal conditions? Mm -hmm. So let's say I asked you what your address is and you look one way and you're you're talking and what car do you drive? How do you like your job? You do all these behaviors and then all of a sudden I say, you know, is there any reason that someone would tell me that, you know, you were being unfaithful or you committed a crime or whatever? And then the behavior is drastically different from your normal. Mm -hmm. That's what we would look for more than any someone scratches their nose or something like that, which is a lot of uh, a lot of BS Got is, it. is involved there. Got it. So, so the biggest the biggest thing to look for 
is a deviation from baseline. Yeah. Got it. And that, that's so interesting because anytime I've ever caught someone doing something, it's only because there was a deviation from baseline. They either, you know, I'll give you a simple example. I had a girl I was seeing, uh, you know, she'll normally text me when she wakes up. She texted me at 7 a.m. I woke up at 11 this day. She texted me at 7 a.m. Hey, good morning. How are you? And then again at 10 a.m. Hey, what are you doing? Like, let's hang out. She's never done that in the entire time known her. It was maybe two and a half months, but never, ever done that. We text every day, so I have enough data to understand that. And I immediately knew that she was, you know, I suspected she was with somebody else, but I, I knew who this person was. And I immediately knew. So I called that person. I'm like, hey, what's up? How are you? How was it? You know, she told me she was with you. He's like, she told you? <laughs> she told me that she didn't, you're the one person she didn't want to know. I'm like, yeah, she ended up telling me herself. And he's like, yeah, it was good, whatever. So I just stopped talking to her. But I thought it was very funny because that, that sec, if she didn't give me that second text, I would have assumed it was them. But it was, it was the fact that she texted me twice in a three hour period without me responding. Right. That showed maybe some kind of compensation. Which in someone else, the, that may, could have meant she watched a romantic movie and was feeling great about yeah. you know, hanging out with you. But it's still a difference that we need to look at. So how, how I see it, because I have a, a decent understanding for something like this, right? Uh, obviously not as in-depth as yours, but if, if I see someone starting to like me, right? The pattern is they're liking me more and more. Mm -hmm. It could make sense that they like me a lot more after, you know, we hung out or she missed me or, you know, I said something or we had a really good day, date or something. But if we weren't really doing well, it's whatever. And then out of nowhere, she likes me or out of nowhere, she doesn't like me. Those are so, it's just so off. It's, it's not even congruent. Like, and what I mean by that is it's not, it's not a slow buildup or just, okay, she was already liking me more. It makes sense. Maybe she fell in love, right? Or yeah. and vice versa, a guy. So is that another indication kind of if, if it makes sense that it's heading in that direction and then now it's at a too extreme? Yeah. And I would say one thing that, that you could have done in that situation is mm -hmm. is face to face. If I mention the name of a person involved with a crime. Mm -hmm. So if you had mentioned this person's name that she was unfaithful with yeah. in face to face, you would have seen blink rate go from normal to sky high very quickly and that and that's an indication that there's something there yeah because there's her baseline is, is changing Go but on. we have other indicators of deception someone not using pronouns in a statement someone not contracting words instead of did didn't they say did not couldn't could not there's a lot of linguistic ways that we can detect deception too now you know uh from nlp perspective language words are only seven percent of communication. I never actually agreed with that. No, I, I teach it because I wasn't sure what the, the, the research is, but you know, knowing from you, it's not like that. What, how much of language really makes a difference? I think the language makes a huge difference. Okay. I think, yeah, I think language is about 30%. 30%. So a third of communication, it's not 7%. No, I think, and that's a give or take. It's going to be different for every culture. Every yeah. person is going to be a little, but it's, different. it's significantly more than a measly 7%. Yeah. Cause I, I, People, especially body language experts, will, will quote that stuff all the time. And I can't show you a movie uh, in in Ukrainian and have you like, well, the words are only seven. Yeah, I won't get ninety three percent of the movie. Yeah, yeah without that's the right. words. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I don't know if someone's happy or sad, but I don't really know what's going on. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So, if I'm getting into a business meeting, right? Because I always talk about rapport, creating connections. I truly believe the more connections you have, the more resources you have uh, in regards to being able to connect with people, network with people, uh, the more successful you'll get. The faster you'll learn, the more, you know, it just, yeah. you're, the group of people you're around is really beneficial. That's why I always encourage people to come to seminars because usually the people who come to seminars or personal development things want to get better. They usually have some money, right? Like a ticket's around $2,000 for my base seminars. And right. a lot of people I talk to are like, people would pay $2,000 for that. It's like, yeah, because the people who pay $2,000 for that can afford $2,000, <laughs> yeah. you know? And the people who usually say that are the ones who are working some minimum wage job somewhere, or they got a degree, you know? So as a behavioral expert, I know you have seminars, but do you think you're more likely to find people who are trying to grow or get better who go to these personal development things or, or less likely? Or do you think they're weirdos? I think the people that I attract to my seminars yeah. have kind of hit a ceiling of financial growth, personal growth, and the stuff that I do, I invented most of it. Yeah. So they see that that's kind of the next level is in, in getting the superpower. Because if you look at business, uh, if I'm a psychologist, I'm a police officer, I'm a school teacher, 
Every human being is in the job of selling. Everyone's in sales, which means we're all in the business of psychology and understanding behavior. That's where our money is going to come from. Uh, our level of charisma is going to dictate whether or not we get hired or promoted or uh, we have followers in the workplace because there's a huge difference between the leader and the person that's in charge. Huge difference. Now, a lot of what I teach is about inner game, right? Like your personal mindset when you're influencing someone or, or your emotional state, right? Being able to control composure. Yeah. Your personal composure, you know, and, and making decisions based on which emotion is best for the situation. Because uh, oftentimes there will be things that stimulate us in negative ways uh, that prevent us from being as effective, in my opinion. So I teach a lot of my, you know, my clients and my followers how to change their emotions, how to gain control over their patterns. But, you know, let's say I am in a high stress situation. I know you've been in combat, you know, you've had bullets grazed past your head, you know, things of the sort. How can I practice gaining more composure, right? Because a lot of people are, you know, they get a bill that's an extra hundred dollars and, and they lose it, right? So if I'm someone who might have anxiety attacks or I, I have a lot of stress in my life, and maybe it could be massive stress, like a million dollars in debt out of nowhere, you know, what, what do you think someone could do to minimize that and allow them to be more effective? So I think a lot of times people want a, I'm, I want to put a steering wheel here. Yeah. So I, where, where's the steering wheel that I need to be able to get myself back on course as yeah. fast as possible? Now I would say that I've been doing this for tw uh, more than 20 years and at an obsessive level. And I crossed the 30,000 hour mark of doing this stuff a long time ago. Have I been alive for 30,000 hours? I don't know, You're probably not. <laughs> but uh, the steering wheel that most people are in search of is, is awareness. Yeah. So if I gave you a little stack of note cards and I said, Marcel, at the end of each day at 5 p.m., I want you to draw the little pendulum on there and say whether or not you were being posturing you were kind of crumbling, or you were in the middle with, and you had a lot of composure. And what what is posturing or crumbling? Just for yeah. Sorry. So posturing would be uh, someone who is people think is confident, but their confidence is posturing up against feelings of inferiority or feelings of of lack. So the the guy who's louder than everybody else, the guy who is forcing himself to look uh, confident or to look powerful. Yeah. And the collapse would be the person that's almost apologizing for everything too much. And we, we can do this financially as well. Uh, when I first started my business, I was active doing the military, but someone would call me and I would say, oh, my, my price is like 1500 bucks. And they would say, and they would just make a noise. They would say, oh, and I would be like, well, I mean, I, I can make a deal with you. I mean, I could do a thousand, I could do five. You know what? I'll write you a check. I, yeah. you know, you know. <laughs> You're like, I'll pay you to wait yeah. me at. Yeah. And uh, I used to have that issue. So that would be the that would be the collapse or the crumbling part of that. So at the end of the day, because uh, a lot of people who collapse all the time, when they finally break, the solution looks like the opposite end. So I need to posture. I need to move all the way over here. And if I'm posturing all the time and something really happens really bad, I'm going to move all the way to being a doormat again. So throughout the day, how was my level of composure throughout that day? So you can rate that on, let's say I'll give you a task, 5 p.m. every day before you eat dinner, write down how you did that day on your composure, your personal composure, and don't do anything else. I don't want you to set goals for composure. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to just write it down every day. That awareness all by itself gives your brain, says, okay, uh, Chase wants to focus on this. I'm going to start looking at it, and it does. It, everything else is a byproduct. It knows what to do. It knows exactly how to fix that. The awareness is the best steering wheel. Got it. it you know, it's so interesting because I know when I was younger, right? I was insecure. Uh, initially, I would posture, right? I was posturing a lot. I was like, okay, hey, I'm going to show everyone that I'm the best. I'm the most confident. So everything I would do is like I, I would, if someone didn't think I was confident, I would on purpose do something ridiculous. You know, it, yeah. it, but it, it's interesting because the, the foundation there was the insecurity. And as I actually gained more confidence and I became more mature, I, I never crumbled, but I came more towards the middle, right? Where, but initially when I was first starting, I would be more on the crumbling side of things, right? Apologize. I would try and be quiet. I wouldn't, you know, be out of people's way, you know, scared to speak my mind. I was scared to, to say things. And then I, I developed a, a crazy amount of confidence out of nowhere, right? It was like a new strategy for me. It was almost like a high that as soon as I felt insecure, I could overcome it by posturing. 
and it would get rid of it, but it, you know, it's too much. <laughs> yeah. So I, I became more in the middle now, but that's one of those things. The way, the way that I would measure confidence, yeah. whether it's real or not, is confidence should be transferable. So a confident person that makes people feel insecure or small around them isn't a confident person. I agree with that. So you should be able, the, the higher confidence you are, the more it should transfer to make other people feel, feel confident yep. with you. Yep. So if you're a confident hypnotist, like you are, you're giving that person confidence in your abilities. You're giving them confidence in their abilities yeah. as well. You know, I always say, I use the word leadership often. I always say a good leader brings other people up and a bad leader brings other people down. Like you've seen Lion King, right? Yeah. So I always say there's Mufasa and then there's Scar. The Mufasa is, you know, this lion that lifts everyone up, takes care of the jungle. And then you have Scar is very selfish. And I, I talk about this concept of scarcity and abundance. And, you know, you look at primates and... You know, they did a study with chimpanzees, you probably know about it, where the alpha male has two to three times more testosterone than the rest of the primates. And I found that interesting because that they also have two to three times more oxytocin than the eldest female, which is usually the female that has the most oxytocin in her blood compared to any other primate there. And for those of you who don't know, oxytocin is the chemical for connection and love and giving. Yeah. So I found that very funny because it's like, okay, that means that the more in abundance you are, the more you're able to give. Right. Whereas if you're in scarcity and you kind of bully your way to the top and you put other people down, you're always taking, you're not giving, which I think is horrible leadership. And, yeah. you know, if you look at primates, those kinds of leaders, the bullies don't last very long and they'll gang up against them and kill them. Whereas you'll have a leader who is not the strongest or the biggest, but they're the most charismatic, they're the most giving, they're the most fair. And, you know, the tribe will literally die for them because of the amount of loyalty they've been able to produce. So true. So true. You know. How would you apply a lot of that? How do, you, how do you apply some of that in hypnosis? You know, I think the biggest thing is, especially with having this kind of power, because a lot of people don't realize how much power they have. When, when, they, you know, when you're very confident, that alone is a powerful, very yeah. powerful trait, because people look up to you, they influence you, they look for that certainty. And I think a lot of people will lead people in the wrong direction. I, I take confidence and I take leadership as a privilege. I don't think of it as, as a right, I think of it as a privilege. So if I have the privilege to lead somebody, I want to make sure that I can lead them to do whatever they want. And I always say this. I'm like, look, I had so many leaders tell me that I cannot do things, right? Especially when I was learning hypnosis, how many limiting beliefs did I get? You know, you, you can't get yeah. clients. You, you can't charge a lot. You, you're too young. You're not going to learn. I'm, my skill level is, is significantly higher than all my mentors put together, right? Like they didn't really know anything compared to what I know, but that's because I was willing to push the boundaries. And they were limiting me a lot. And there were other leaders that would put me down and say, you can't do this. Because as soon as I started to make more money or I'd push the boundaries, they'd get insecure. They'd try and put me down. And I, you know, immediately I'd break rapport with all these mentors and stop seeing them that way. And I found that the mentors I had or the, the seminars I went to with the most amazing people that I learned from were the ones who loved when I was winning. Right? Yeah. And I look at my clients. I have some clients that out of nowhere will go make 800K in eight months you know, and, or, you know, from $5,000. And I'll, I'll have clients who just crush it out of nowhere. I love that. That's a high for me because it's like I get to live through them. And yeah. because I, I've worked on a lot of my insecurities, it's very difficult for me to be envious of another person. Yeah. And I think jealousy comes from, and that, that's a really big, big thing people should work on, is jealousy comes from not believing you can do it yourself. So you're upset that someone else is doing it. Right? Even in relationships, I, I found that jealousy comes from me not believing I could have what someone else got. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So it's just, I, I hate jealousy, I hate envy, I hate feeling like you can't do something. So, you know, anyone who's watching this, I truly think any, the hum, human beings are capable of so much more than we think. Yeah. It's just, we, we're, we're bound to believe that we're not, and that we're not as intelligent or not as capable, which yeah. is really not true. So, you know, you've obviously pushed the boundaries on anything that was ever thought possible, and there's only so much you're allowed to talk about. But... You know, what, just, just for entertainment purposes, because maybe the, someone watching this has never heard of you, what, what is a, maybe interrogation you had uh, back in the day? You told a story about someone trying to cut your head off, things like that. You know, what's something very entertaining that they can hear just so they understand how, who you are? Like, you know, <laughs> I kind of want to brag about having you here because for those of you who don't know, this guy's the coolest guy I've ever met in my life. I tell everyone I meet, you're the coolest guy I've ever met. I'll tell you a civilian interrogation okay. uh, story. So I get hired to... Uh, fly to Los Angeles and work for a company here that is in a hotel. And I can't say the name of the company, but that's fine. Uh, they have this list of uh, 29 employees that are potentially 
might be stealing from the company. Okay, so just to clarify, so it's 29 people that are working for this company. So it's obviously a big company uh, that might have stolen from them. Yeah, so it's 29 people that they've said these people might have something, but we don't know. Uh, I want to fly Chase out here and have Chase do an interrogation. And find out. Yeah, so in four days I had to interrogate all of them. So I had about maybe a half hour per person. Okay. And I had to get them to confess to a felony in less than 30 minutes. Okay. And uh, out of those 29 people, uh, 28 of them were guilty and 28 of them confessed. Within in under 21 minutes, they confessed to a felony. And, and for those of you guys watching this, just to show you how impressive that is, you can go online and look up interrogation film. You'll have a police officer or detective trying to interrogate someone for four days, five days, and they yeah. won't get anything. Uh, for someone to be this talented, to be able to get an interrogation, get them to confess, and have, what's, what's, what's your uh, percentage? Confessions? I'm at 96 right now. 96. Is there anyone on the planet that truthful, has that? Truthful confessions. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone in the world who has that kind of? I don't know. I, I don't think so. Yeah. That, that's, it's world class. Like, it's, it's unbelievable how, how, imagine this, you kill someone and I have to get you to confess to it. Who's going to want to confess to that? How are you going to find out, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, there's things that you, you know, the, the way I got introduced to Chase was actually a friend of mine referred his book called The Ellipses Manual. And that book tells you a lot about body language and, and things of the sort. Now, I was showing him a, a TikTok video of somebody just, just for the sake of it. And I'm watching it. It looks completely normal to me. And he's like, yeah, that person's lying and they're disgusted of what they just said. And it, I, <laughs> I'm just like, how did you see that? He saw it instantly. You know, and another crazy thing is we're at a restaurant uh, picking up sushi. Someone walks by. Can I share this? I don't even remember what happened. When we were getting the sushi uh, and then someone walked by and you said they were. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so we, we got sushi. We're waiting to get sushi and someone walks by and he's like, that person is a sex- sexually deviant. So I'm like, the fuck is that? I don't even know what that means. And he's like, it means they have, you know, uh, sexual deviant behavior and fetishes and things like that. And it, it was super interesting because as soon as he says that, you, you could actually make sense out of it, right? Anyone who has that kind of behavior has similar mannerisms. Yeah. But he was able to identify that in, in maybe two seconds. And here's where all that comes together. Right. So it, once you have the behavior skills to understand profiling, everything changes that I'm saying. So if we're in a conversation and I see blink rate go up, I see your shoulders shrug, I see you start fidgeting and all this stuff, Mm -hmm. my words are changing. And it sounds like a normal conversation, but every single thing that I'm saying throughout the conversation is adapting and changing to exactly what you're telling me that you need with your body and with your words. And Like a technique that you could take home right now is if, if I say, what, what did you like most about your last job that you had? And you say, well, it was awesome. Everybody there was fantastic. So those two words, awesome and fantastic, I'm going to remember. And I'm going to use those to describe what I would like for you to do. And if you're talking about someone else, uh, like your previous employer who was, uh, you didn't like, and you said awful and disgusting, those are the words I might use to describe my competitor to you or to describe the consequences of not doing so, what we're doing. You know, would you say that the biggest trait in being able to understand people is to be more observant? Uh, yes, at the beginning. So you only have to be observant for enough amount of time to where the watching the behaviors becomes unconscious for you. So and it doesn't take long. And, but what takes a while is getting the skills to be able to do that, yeah. right? Because I, I can watch someone and pretty quickly record a baseline. Uh, you know, I won't necessarily be aware of why I know that's their baseline, yeah. but I can notice when something's a little off. And I'm sure anyone at home, uh, if you've ever had a boyfriend, girlfriend, mom, dad, friend, and, and you see they're a little bit off, you could sense that something's off, right? Like, like you, yeah. you talk about this, there's you know, the million brain, right? And uh, it doesn't speak English, so we get that gut feeling telling us something might be off here. And a lot of people don't trust that. Yeah. Right. Do you think we should? Yes. Most of the time, I, I would. When it comes to psychopaths and like extreme cases, the gut is usually always wrong, in, okay. in most cases. And this is research that was done by the FBI and people smarter than I am on it. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, I, I think we all have an ability to understand human behavior. I hear it from all kinds of people. Like, well, well, I do this naturally all the time. But I said it's. 
you can't weaponize something you're not knowing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So when you bring it into your conscious awareness, you're doing those things on purpose instead of on accident. And that's when it becomes a superpower. Yeah. You know, I want to transition this conversation uh, because, you know, I want this to be the, the finale of our, of our talk uh, because there's obviously so much more that people will learn if they come see us speak in Miami in May. Uh, if you're watching this, you're probably watching, if you're watching this before May 15th and 16th and you're interested in getting a ticket to the seminar, click the link below and schedule a call or you can just put your, book your ticket uh, directly. But I know, I think we're going to do an interview mostly yeah. uh, because I don't want people to just come here. But, you know, there's uh, this concept uh, called a Manchurian candidate. And I know you, you know a lot about this, probably yeah. more than anyone in the world. Uh, and, you know, what, what is that? If you were to define that, what is that? So the way that it was defined in, in pop culture is the same way that it, it really exists, is that if I took a person and literally built in another identity inside of that person. Like almost make them schizophrenic or you just... Sort of. Uh, schizophrenic implies that the disease interferes negatively with the person's life. Yeah. Uh, so if we have two identities and they're working in harmony, there's not a disorder, but there might be a dissociated identity there. So pretty much so they become another person. They can on a switch. They can switch between. With a different moral compass and different values. Totally different. So I could pretty much engineer a, like, I can make you a completely different person, different memories, different everything. Like, a yeah. di like if I were on a computer and I was logging in with a different user, this is like a completely different user. Yes. So could, at, the, at the end, the, the final part of that definition would be that if I did it to you uh, and I had another identity in you, I could either A, I could have you know about it, or B, have you not know that it exists. And the third part of the Manchurian candidate is that they can be activated. This other identity can be turned on at, at will of the person doing it uh, to execute anything, to, to go lift weights more often, to uh, go make their bed, or to go commit a shooting. Now, you said that you can be aware of that identity, but can that identity also be aware of you? Yes, and can the absolutely. And is there ever a case where the identity becomes so dominant that one takes over the other? No. I've never heard of it or seen it. Okay. That's going to be very hard because you're, you're going to have to override about 600 million years of evolution to do that. Which is almost impossible. That's kind of hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But this is, is this something that's programmed into us already through evolution? Like are you doing anything outside of our norm? No. In fact, there's four things if you have influence techniques. If an influence technique is not rooted in one of these four things, it's not going to work very well. So I want you to think, just imagine uh, back in, imagine going back 17, maybe 150,000 years, like to cave times okay. or, you know, whenever we were in caves. And just imagine a little woman standing in there, and let's say her name is Amy. Amy it lives a hard life. Uh, if she does things that break from her tribe, she can get kicked out. That means she won't have sex. That means she won't reproduce. That means her DNA stops existing. If she doesn't listen to the tribal leader, her DNA could stop existing. If she doesn't focus on what everyone else is doing around her, she could stop existing forever. And finally, if she has an emotional event in childhood, I, I went up and smacked uh, the tribal leader on, on the butt and you know I got punished for it because it's a child. Then we have an emotional, she's forming an emotional memory, could get kicked out of the tribe if she doesn't remember all the lessons that she learned growing up. So those are F-A-T-E. The first is focus. And that is, she was had to be focused to stay alive. The second one is authority. So it has to go, or we're pre-programmed to follow authority, all of us. And I could go into some very, very scary stuff, which we obviously don't have time for. We'll, yeah. we'll talk about it at the seminar. Yeah. Uh, obedience to authority is programmed in all human beings, even people with mental uh, issues. So focus, authority, authority matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, that's the reason obedience to authority is why none of your ancestors died a virgin. They all, they all got laid. Makes sense. <laughs> uh, finally is the T in fate, and that's tribe. What are the people doing around me? What is this society or what is this culture doing? And even in the room. If everyone else, everyone in a restaurant starts gasping and looking towards an exit, that's where you're going to look because the tribe is doing it. Yeah. And finally, the emotion. That's where we have a, a memory from childhood that has an emotional content. That's why trauma stays with us forever because the emotions are there trying to protect us. 
-hmm. So like when somebody doesn't feel confident, we have social anxiety, that's evolution. That's your, that's a hundred, that's maybe a million year old brain trying to protect you uh, from a saber toothed tiger. Got it's it. the exact same brain, the exact same emotional chemical process to protect you from a tiger. And that's one thing I teach a lot of my clients uh, to, to make it super short is just to repeat to yourself, there are no tigers here. That's yeah. a that's an old piece of hardware and we don't have an admin control panel. Yeah. We can't go in and like, okay, I'm going to turn that program down, off. Now, when you look at, you know, I, one of the first things that initially got me really intrigued with hypnosis is I saw Darren Brown, uh, he had a, a special where, called The Ath Assassin where he dedicated it to this guy named Sirhan Sirhan. Yeah which uh, assassinated RFK, right, Kennedy. Uh, and, you know, he wanted to see if he could replicate it, and he hypnotized somebody to commit an assassination unknowing to them, you know, that it wasn't a real gun or anything like that. Now, that's obviously what a Manchurian candidate can be used for uh, if you were to weaponize it. Now, you know, you look at the population, a lot of people are followers, you, you know, a lot of people are, uh, have a short attention span. How likely is it that somebody you know, like what percentage of the population can go there? I would say 100% could go there, just about. But it would depend on circumstances. But when we talk about someone who's suggestible enough and they're kind of the perfect candidate for a Manchurian candidate, yeah. probably 38%. So 38% of people, and how long, uh, you know, is there a time, a time frame you're allowed to share for how long something like that could happen? Like how quickly? Yeah, so it could theoretically be done in, in a day and just some regular office hours, like a nine to five, you could probably get it done. But to make it more effective and, and last longer and more predictable, and that's that's the biggest thing we worry about if you're making a Manchurian candidate, you want it to be predictable and reliable. Yeah, not just out of nowhere. Yeah, so the more time you can invest, the better it's gonna be. But you can do it for great. I mean, imagine if I could program in a client of mine another not necessarily an identity, but a feeling of there's a, I'm going to install an assistant in your head that's going to stop you from eating disgusting food, or I'm going to make you, that that person that I put in there is going to get you out of bed. It's going to make you make your bed. It's going to make you run in the mornings or work out. Go make money, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, when this leads me to ask you this question, you know, are there people out there who are not good uh, who, who use this? I think I think it can be weaponized, yeah. So, you know, would you suggest that if I'm an average person, I know nothing about this, my first time hearing anything about this stuff. Um, you know, obviously it's all real, right? 100%. You know, if I were to go learn, right, educate myself, does that increase the likelihood or decrease the likelihood of something like this happening or me being influenced by someone negatively or, you know, some sociopath, narcissist, psychopath, you know, affecting me? Right. So there's no vaccination against any of this stuff. Okay. Uh, but the more you understand about these techniques, and ke please keep in mind that it's dangerous, as, as dangerous as a kitchen knife is dangerous. Yeah. We all have kitchen knives in our house, and they don't, you know, nobody's... Yeah. I would say a knife can, you know, in the hands of a doctor could save lives, and the hands of someone else can end it. Yeah. You know, it's... So it's a weapon. So, I mean, even looking at uh, aversion therapy, which is an approved psychology technique to treat all kinds of stuff. But that's, a, that's literally the brainwashing recipe that we got from World War II. This is how brainwashing works, and then bam, we apply it to psychotherapy. And, and aversion therapy is just an intense form of classical conditioning. Yeah. Right? And for those of you who don't know, aversion therapy is like, let's say every time I go to smoke, they electrocute me. <laughs> or they'll tell me to, to smoke, and then I, you know, I throw up. Uh, you know, something right. horrible, yeah. right, which creates a, a trigger in the brain that creates a huge negative association. Yeah, it just stops the, stops the dopamine pathway. I, I, do, I do a softer version of that in hypnosis where I'll make someone associate like raw chicken or food poisoning to smoking and they That's quit right. in a matter of seconds. Yeah. yeah. But it's permanent. They literally quit permanently. If the aversion is, if I could see that their emotional state is intense enough. Yeah. You know, and you'll see people literally, I'll do it. They'll go to smoke and then instantaneously like gag, like fall, collapse, this, like throw it away. But sometimes it's not permanent. Yeah, and I've seen that as well. But creating a Manchurian candidate or just calling it that is going to trigger uh, people to go back to movies that they've watched. But yeah. it can be used for absolute good. I mean, there's, there's documented cases of people uh, with dissociative identity disorder, which is multiple personalities, yeah. where one of the identities has glaucoma 
and the other one doesn't. Really? Oh yeah. That's how much the mind really controls the body. There's one. There's cases where one was blind and the other one wasn't. To the point where the pupils were non-reactive to light, huh. and that's, so if that's, if that's really possible huh? from a and that's what we call a psychogenic illness, oh. so that's that's possible from a psychogenic, which means it's created in the brain and psychologically, not physiologically. Yep. Then, what could we do for depression? What could we do for motivation or charisma yeah. or? I'm a huge believer that we can get rid of most. The mind can get rid of almost any. Um, you know, negative state, and you're a neuroscientist, right? You know, I, I actually don't, I'm not that big of a fan of medication or drugs. Uh, I think most of them are nonsense, and if you look at antidepressants, studies show that 90% of them are just as effective as the placebo, which yeah. means that they don't actually do anything. Except give you a lot of kidney failure, liver problems. Yeah, and a bunch of negative headaches, side effects yeah. and kill you. Yeah. So I, I really think people have the ability to change their mindset and, and potentially do things that are beyond what we are even aware of, you know, scientifically and a lot of the time people are aware of these things scientifically but they suppress them like when i was doing research uh you know for hypnosis and, and a lot of a lot of studies were were hidden you know regarding what, what hypnosis can do for example for uh, hiv if you have aids and you're hypnotized there were studies showing that i forgot the percentage but it was it was a large percentage of people they're able to go from i think it was 200 le or less t cells to over 800 normal is what 1200 1300 Give or take. Yeah. I'd love to see that study. Yeah. I, I have to find it again, but it took me four hours to find something like that. It's ridiculous. You know, that they suppress. It's, it's like you look, at, you look at what's influencing, you know, I don't want to say it out loud, but you know what, what's influencing most of the education system uh, is money and business and the specific organizations that run it. Uh, yeah. Like the vaccine now, you know. Uh, and they, they don't care about your health. They don't care about your well-being. They just care about making money. If you look at in the 70s, one, one big CEO from the you know, Big Pharma, which is the organization I was talking about, uh, said that his goal is to make medication like a piece of gum where you take it every day. Yeah. And that's what they've done. And if, if there was a way to sell people diet and exercise, it yeah. would be the most prescribed drug in America. Yeah. Because it works the best. <laughs> there is. It's just not through a pill. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's right. You know, there's also a way to sell people behavior and mindset that's much more likely to make them money and behavior that mindset and skill set that's much more likely to influence others. Sure. You know, there's science behind all these things. It's just people aren't educated on it. Now, for those of you at home who are watching this, uh, if you want to learn how to really, really control your mind, how to understand how to read people, uh, how to influence others, which, by the way, is the reason I'm a 22-year-old uh, who lives in, you know, a mansion, uh, have any car I want, buy my parents' cars, just got my parents a house. You know, I can do whatever I want, and I feel good all the time. I'm very confident. You know, I can party without any alcohol or drugs. You know, I literally have control over my mind, over my emotions. Very few things can make me upset. Uh, if you want to learn the tools that, that, you know, I know, the knowledge I have, the knowledge he has, which, by the way, people offer tens of millions of dollars to learn from him, and he won't even take them on. Uh, this seminar is probably one of the few opportunities you will have to do so. I know your cheapest seminar is what, $15,000? Uh, the cheapest is a one day and it's 15000 yeah. yeah. So you get to learn from him and from me for two days. Uh, I believe the ticket, if you get this now, early bird pricing is around 2000 If you wait till closer to the date, it'll be around 4000 But still ridiculously cheap. So make sure you get your ticket now. Uh, and I'm not just saying this to say it. Seats will fill out because of the fact that there are COVID-19 restrictions on the amount of people we can have in the room. So if you want to be there in person instead of online, make sure you click the link below uh, or send me a DM if this is on Instagram and let's get you a spot. Yeah. Yep. We'll go over all the dangerous stuff, all the weaponized stuff, most importantly, stuff that actually gets immediate results and you can use right away. Yeah, that, that's the biggest thing I like about Chase. That's the biggest thing my style of teaching is, is, hey, you come, you can walk away instantly being able to use anything you want. So if you want to make more money, you want to change your mindset, you want to have way more confidence, you want to be able to influence people, you want to be able to persuade someone, an investor, just get people thinking about you, right? If it's a relationship, have someone just thinking about you nonstop, right? What is falling in love? It's just that you start thinking about them more and more and more, you get more and more invested, the fantasy grows, not of nowhere you're in love with someone, right? That's, that's self-hypnosis. You hypnotize yourself to fall in love with someone. Yeah. What if you could start that process uh, in maybe five, 10 minutes, and then a week later, the person you talk to is in love with you? Or what if you could start that process with an investor, have them fall in love with an idea, or want to give you more money? So there's just, there's countless ways to get, you know, 
it, un, unbelievable knowledge here. I don't really need to sell it. You guys heard this conversation. You could research him. You could research me. You could see some other videos where we teach and talk. You could see how we implement these things. Uh, but if you're someone who's ready to change your life and you want to invest in yourself, this is the move. So click the link below and we'll see you in Miami on May 15th and 16th. Both full day events will probably go longer than what it says. It's right now it's 10 to 8. We'll probably go longer than that because there's only so much time in two days for us to teach. Maybe we should make it a third day. Yeah. And if we do this course again, I'm, I'm not doing it at this price. Yeah, of course not. <laughs>